It's a pleasure to uh, be in front of you this morning or this afternoon to welcome Susan, Susan Avery, who is the president and director of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, uh, as the speaker for today's colloquium. Uh, I also want to thank everybody who is uh, not resident in Building 401 for braving the still uh, slippery and snowy conditions out there. Uh, so it's actually nice to see a lot of faces in the audience today. So uh, Susan's research activities include atmospheric dynamics, precipitation, and radar observing systems. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that she's an atmospheric scientist who's working on oceanographic problems. So uh, in today's talk, she'll tell us about the challenges and potential benefits that can come from using new and transformative technologies to study the interaction between specifically that, the ocean, and the rest of the Earth's systems. As an atmospheric scientist, she has addressed a multitude of national and international forums, uh, including uh, uh, giving the TEDx Boston lecture and, so, and speaking in front of several congressional committees, uh, mainly to convey the importance and uh, to try and uh, convey an understanding of the Earth as a system containing oceans, atmosphere, terrestrial, and human interactions. And we're really uh, quite fortunate to have her to give us uh, an introduction to these topics today. Uh, Susan has served on num numerous boards. Uh, she has a long list of uh, distinguished accolades and awards, which I will not go through this morning. Um, and she's really been operating at the highest levels for a number of years in a number of different positions, including having been one of two United uh, U.S. representatives to the United Nations Scientific Advisory Board to provide guidance about science, technology, and innovation for sustainable development. Um, also, she's uh, almost a local. Her PhD is from University of Illinois, um, and she's also a past director for the uh, Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences at the University of uh, Colorado Boulder. Um, so today she'll give us an introduction to the research that she's, uh, her institution has been working on. Um, I think this fits very nicely into the broader perspective that we have here both at APS and Argonne of trying to make the science that we do uh, globally important and paying attention to the ways in which synchrotron radiation and x-ray science touch on environmental issues and our ability to understand uh, living systems. So with that, thank you very much and we look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, been a real pleasure. My first trip to Argonne, and I've uh, had a very busy day um, exploring uh, all the things that you do here, just getting a little little uh, hint on what the capabilities are, and it's truly uh, remarkable. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit, certainly in my conversations that came up today, when, when people say the word Woods Hole, um, they conjure up a certain institutions. Um, and there are, in reality, six science institutions in Woods Hole. So some people would say Woods Hole and think of the Marine Biological Lab, which of course is now a, a, an affiliate of the University of Chicago, just as, 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 as Argonne is. Um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution um, and the um, Woods Hole Research Center. These are three science institutions that are all um, independent, not-for-profit um, institutions, except MBL now is, of course, affiliated with the University of Chicago. In addition, there is a USGS uh, branch there that does a lot of work on coastal erosion. Um, and there's the uh, Northeast uh, Fisheries Science Center um, uh, of NOAA that we uh, do a lot of collaborative work with as well. And finally, the last organization is a small nonprofit organization that um, offers um, ex uh, experiences at sea, semesters at sea to undergraduate uh, students. Um, this is really a working, this is not a nice, on a nice cruise ship. Uh, students come out and actually um, learn how to sail uh, a sailboat and uh, along the way learn about some astronomy, some ocean science, some climate, some history, maritime history. So just to let you know, I am from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. It's the largest of the institutions. It's year-round. It's a comprehensive um, organization from a science point of view, engineering point of view, operations, um, and we do have a, a joint degree education program with MIT um, along the way. So that said, um, what I wanted to chat with you a little bit today is uh, the blue planet um, and the fact that we are um, living on a, on a planet that is really governed in many ways by two fluids. Um, one happens to be compressible, the other incompressible. Um, one harbors a rich biodiversity of life, the other harbors a, a lot of interactions with um, our sun and solar system and plasma fields. Um, but the two, when you, when you look at them, um, are really important for driving life and the habitability um, of this planet. And often when I hear people talk about weather, they think of it as an atmospheric problem only. Um, that's not true. The atmosphere and ocean are very much connected in our weather systems, certainly in our climate systems. 
um, and uh, the implications of uh, doing one over the other are pretty severe as we're looking into the future with uh, major changes and what we can uh, expect to see. Um, I'd like to, to just talk about the fact that we do have one atmosphere and we have one ocean. Many people think that we have many oceans, we have one ocean because physically it is connected as one ocean. Um, and if you were to drain all the water off the planet, which is what I'm doing here virtually, you will see that you undercover um, a solid earth that harbors um, some of the tallest mountains on this planet, uh, some of the deepest trenches on this planet. Um, and all of that water that covers two-thirds of the planet's surface, of course, is in a sphere that's less than the side of the moon, or at least an order of dimension smaller. You drain off all of the fresh water, that's the upper small um, uh, dot there, and then the tiniest is all of the available fresh water. So the point of this is to illustrate the fact that we have a very precious sort of resource here that many people when they gaze out in the ocean or even in the atmosphere think it's infinite, it cannot be destroyed, there's plenty of resources out there, nothing's um, going to change, I can do whatever I want. Um, and in reality, of course, this, uh, this, uh, this, this little here is basically what we have available for us. Now, some of this, which is locked up in ice caps, is coming down into here in the future, but overall, you, you, know, you don't make water. You might be able to take some of this and make some fresh water, out of it, obviously very energy intensive processes um, right now that, that does that. So um, let's take a look at these two fluids and why we're calling it a dance, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this. On the left is basically um, a NASA model simulation of the ocean currents, of surface, surface currents. Um, on the right is a, a visualization of cloud cover, that satellite imagery of, of cloud cover. And when I show this to um, a group of venture capitalists, um, they, they were, you know, most people, they say, oh, you can see that th these two fluids are flowing. Now, they've obviously sped up the um, animation of the ocean currents. They're not going that fast. Um, but they are two fluids. You can see clearly sort of the, whoops, oops, wrong way, <laughs> wrong button. I don't know if this will go now. Um, you, can, you can basically see sort of the currents along here, and the, you, you'll see the cloud cover along in this band, and, and you see similar patterns, okay, and you see that they can be connected. You can visualize, in fact, that these two are connected in many ways. These, these motions are transporting um, and interacting with each other, and in fact, they do. Trem trem tremendous reasons for, uh, tremendous purpose here in, in transporting and circulating heat, uh, momentum, carbon, uh, water, um, and other chemicals. So, um, uh, I called it a dance because when I talked to this group, they said, oh, there's a dance, there's this movement, there's this motion, and, there, and this motion is interacting. And sometimes the atmosphere may lead a dance, and sometimes the ocean may, may lead the dance, um, but they have to connect with each other um, in order to uh, communicate with each other. So let's talk about this as a dance analogy. And, you know, it's going to break down at some point, but it's, it's a way in, in terms of addressing at least what the general public might uh, think is uh, a way of explaining this. Um, and what's obviously setting the stage for this dance is the sun and the planet. Um, and the sunlight heats the earth, making it warmer near the equator than at the poles. And so that heat obviously has to be re redistributed, redistributed in ways. Um, and that's done primarily through um, uh, the global uh, wind patterns that uh, materialize uh, on the planet that, that govern the atmospheric global wind circulation systems um, and the global um, ocean current systems. Um, and together, the cooler temperatures at the poles and the surface winds drive this, this three-dimensional circulation in the um, ocean, it's sometimes called the conveyor belt that you see right here. The, uh, you see along the way here that certain parts of the conveyor belt, the heat is released to the atmosphere. Um, at other parts, the heat is uh, you know, uh, released um, to the atmosphere, and then a lot of this, the heat basically here will circulate warmer, uh, the, the heat imbalance that you have at the equator up into the pole. The atmosphere will do the same thing through its global wind structures um, as well. And about 50% of the rebalancing of the heat um, budget will be, a corp uh, be, will be done by the wind fields, and about 50% will be done by, by the ocean currents itself. Okay. Now, how do the two communicate with each other? Um, they communicate through this, uh, this surface boundary. Uh, the air-sea interface, it's, it's very important and it provides the connection, it's going to provide the communication between the tool. Um, and, and really the fundamental reason that the atmosphere matters to the ocean and the ocean to the atmosphere is that they exchange heat, moisture, momentum, nutrients and biogeochemical properties. And, and this is uh, 
the mechanism of what you do. Now, if you look at this, this is not a flat surface for communicating with. It's a very complex surface. Um, you certainly have uh, things like wind stress and flux of, of latent heat and sensible heat. You have temperature communications. You have wave motion. Some of these waves will break. Some of these will bring off spray and bubbles. These are all waves. You have turbulent eddies both at the um, uh, interface uh, below the ocean, uh, in the ocean, as well as in the, um, in the atmosphere. And of course, there's communication through the solar uh, radiation and up above long wave radiation. Um, and so this is a, a very, very complex interface to communicate. A lot of communication skills are going on. Um, and a lot of uh, people who work on air-sea interaction are really looking at these different mechanisms and what are the fluxes of this heat, the momentum, and the nutrients that basically express themselves and allow the dance to occur um, and the planet to, to uh, move forward with its redistribution. Um, one pattern that clearly emerges, uh, you will have a carbon pattern, but this is, I've just illustrated this with the water. Um, one pattern that actually emerges with this atmosphere ocean communication um, is the, the global water cycle. Um, and I think uh, you, you probably should probably know by now that, uh, that the, the ocean is pr the primary driver um, of the, of the wa global water cycle. Um, you have vapor transportation, land precipitation, clearly human use. Uh, human use of groundwater, rivers, and runoff, all of these contribute to a global picture of our water cycle um, associated with the atmosphere and ocean exchange processes. So one dance um, is the El Nino. How many, most of people probably here um, understand an El Nino uh, signal. Um, and uh, and it's, it's one dance here that, um, that is illustrated here. This is a, a normal year um, in equatorial region where you have um, a, a strong um, walker circulation with trade winds blowing from east to um, west. You have a thermal gradient um, of water in the ocean with a, with a deeper layer of warm water on the west and a shallow layer on the, on, the, on the east. And the cold water presses upwards, replacing the warm surface water here along the east. And this is what, of course, provides rich nutrient waters along the, the, the coast of South, Africa, South America, giving you a, a wonderful um, anchovy uh, harvest along the way. Um, and, and this is sort of a, a normal year um, in, in a circulation pattern here. Um, in an El Nino here, this, uh, this circulation really begins to break, break down. Um, when the, basically you have this, uh, by the way, I should say over here, in this year, most of the convection you will see is over on the western, western part uh, of, the, uh, of the Pacific Ocean. Um, in an El Nino year, the trade winds drop. You have a circulation here where the, when, when the trade winds drop, the warm surface water uh, may fl uh, flow eastwards. These warm sea currents then replace the cold water that you see over here and establishes a deep layer of warm water um, along the coast. And you get then this convection materials moving to the center of the Pacific, and that's what you have the increase, increased convection. So this is sort of a, a La Nina would be basically reversing back to this, but intensified. Okay. So you see this kind of uh, oscillation occurs maybe every seven to ten years, um, sort of sloshing back and forth of, a, of, a, of, the, wind, of the atmosphere and the ocean interfacing, interfacing with each other to create this. Now, this dance goes on um, in the, in the, on the planet here, but it's, it, it's seen around the world. It's not just seen in the equatorial regions. The implications for this dance um, are, are felt um, globally. And, and in fact, what you can see here is that the many locations that, that view this dance will see different sort of weather patterns. So in the United States, generally during an El Nino from January to, February, to April, you'll have sort of a wet region down here. It'll be dry up in here, and this is the perfect time, and I will go to a, an El Nino forecast. It's a perfect time to go visit uh, Washington, the state of Washington, okay? Because you can get beautiful um, dry airs. On the other hand, it's a wonderful time to go visit the deserts of uh, Southern California, where you have blooms of cactus that haven't bloomed for 100 years, at least. Uh, it, at least in a good El Nino year. You see, obviously, dry conditions emerging over here, wet conditions over the Central Pacific, and you can see sort of that this, this El Nino pattern, even though it may be looking as though the atmosphere and ocean are exchanging most of its properties in the equatorial region, why shouldn't it just affect the equatorial region? In fact, it has a global response um, to that picture. Now, so that's just one example of, of a sort of a balance that we've, we've known about in terms of an atmosphere-ocean oscillation. There are many, many other examples I could give. 
But I really want to get to the fact of what's changing. And so humans are changing the, the characters of the dancers of this blue planet. And we're doing it through, obviously, the excess carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere, 9 billion tons of carbon uh, from deforestation. Um, uh, and I don't have the number here. But 40% of that, oh, close cover, 46% of that excess carbon will remain in the atmosphere. The land, about 29% of it will be uptake by plants. And the oceans will get about 26% of that excess carbon dioxide when it gets um, dissolved into seawater. And so the 9 billion tons of, uh, plus car of carbon per year gets distributed in, in many ways like this. And you can obviously see that um, when you start putting uh, this much of carbon back into these systems that the, perhaps the dance players are going to change. Okay. So what is the result of all of this? So um, classic atmospheric carbon dioxide um, uh, signal from the Mauna Loa Observatory. This is the Keeling curve uh, from the 1960s up in, until about, I think it was about 2012 there. Um, and, and you can see, obviously, the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, but what is the heat content? What's happening to the Earth's total heat content associated with this increase in carbon dioxide? Well, if you add up the heat content in the land and the atmosphere and the ice um, associated with this excess um, carbon dioxide, that's this orange curve here. And you can see quite readily that about 90% of the excess heat is actually going into the ocean. So in reality, if we didn't have an ocean right now, OK, our atmosphere would be a lot hotter than what we're looking at right now. It's a buffer. It's been buffering our human activities in the climate zone by basically absorbing the heat um, associated with the extra carbon dioxide that we put in. OK, now, I, I should go back here. I think there were two things that really happened in 2014, that, two measurements that, that really made me think, oh my gosh, We've, we've got, we're, we have the potential for a runaway climate system. One of them is we've reached 400 parts per million in carb, atmospheric carbon dioxide. You know, when I started working, it was 280, 280 parts per million. It's now up to four, 400. The second um, thing that happened was that for the first time, we'd be able to get evidence that the heat uh, and the warming is no longer just penetrating the surface layer of the ocean but it's beginning to penetrate to deeper depths. So there was a lot of controversy in 2014 about the climate hiatus. That the, you know, the global surface temperature was basically leveling off, and, and those climate skeptics were basically saying, oh my goodness, you know, they, they really don't know what they're talking about. Um, there is a climate hiatus, and climate change really isn't going on. But in reality, what's happening here is that, um, oops, I'm just pushing the wrong buttons here. Um, that the, the warming of the surface ocean appears to have slowed, but the deeper ocean is now warming. So this um, shows uh, the total depth is shown in this purple color. The upper is in, in the black and the upper, upper 300 and upper 700 um, meters. And you can begin to see that this heat um, is basically increasing, and you're getting it to deeper and deeper depths within the ocean. Now, that is, a, that is a, a real worrisome factor, because if you think about it, this, the tremendous heat capacity of the ocean, and as it begins to go to deeper levels within the ocean, really means that now you're, not, you're talking about a reservoir of heat that's going to be around for millennia, not just hundreds of years, but millennia. And the deeper it goes, the more changes that you're going to have, the more um, uh, absorption of that, uh, of that ocean, uh, the heat into that ocean means it's going to be around for longer periods of time. Now, people often will say, OK, well, it's cold. And in 2020, certainly in 2014, there was a lot of uh, talk about the fact that, OK, uh, we have a, a very cold um, situation. We have this polar vortex that's coming down. We have this very, very cold along the east coast. Of course, one forgets that it was very, very warm along the west coast uh, last year. And, and part of this polar vortex, or the jet stream, um, is associated with the land or the, the ocean and the atmosphere exchange processes and what's happening in terms of the thermal gradients. And so generally, polar air will be constrained in the wintertime to, uh, uh, to the high latitudes here. And in, 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 the, in the case of 2013, you had a, a, a circulation system in the atmosphere that was contained quite a bit northward of where it would go. 
Um, but in 2014, of course, it extended quite a bit southward, and you could see that it was undulating a lot more than what you had here. Okay? These uh, circulation features are associated with a couple of things. First, the, the polar vortex, or in general, is established by the temperature gradients between the, the mid-latitudes, if you will, and the Arctic. Okay? Now, in the warming situations that we're seeing right now, the Arctic is actually warming more quickly than the mid-latitudes. So that temperature gradient is weakening over time. And so you, you basically get um, sort of a weaker, in a sense, polar vortex, a weaker constraining of the winds um, in, in the, in the, um, into the polar regions. Secondly, you can see here in some years, there's not many undulations here, and there's a lot of undulations here. These are, this is basically planetary wave scale waves. These are associated with forcing functions that is heat driven, again, by major global features. Uh, and the heat difference between um, the land and the ocean will create a, um, a, a, a planetary wave structure. Motions over the major topographic features of the planet will create these wave motions. And if you have a weaker polar vortex in general, the planetary waves will manifest themselves more than if you, did, if you had a strong polar vortex. Okay? Planetary wave activity tends to be larger um, in the winter than in the summer months, so that's why you don't see the same situation happening in the summer months. So although it was very cold um, this particular uh, year in 2014, about a year ago here, along the um, east coast of the United States, basically back in uh, a year earlier, it was very, um, very warm. And in fact, this year, uh, during this period here, uh, because the, the polar vortex was so symmetric and it was quite a bit northward, we had very, very mild uh, warming, uh, mild conditions. Um, and that warmed the ocean pretty significantly. So that when spring came along, the warming waters were already fairly warm and they even got warmer. During this particular uh, spring here, there was um, a lot of um, a massive migration of certain uh, fish species that, uh, northward uh, that you hadn't seen before, um, associated with the movement. Particularly the lobster fisheries uh, in uh, Massachusetts moved quite a bit northward. That was a year when um, the price for lobster was quite low. One could get a good, decent lobster uh, dinner along the way. Um, so with all of this warming situation, the loss of sea ice um, is probably the most sentinel feature of that warming in the Arctic. It's as shown here is just the Arctic sea ice area. But it's important to remember that it's not just the uh, aerial extent of sea ice that's going, that's disappearing. It's also the age of the sea ice and the thickness of the sea ice. Okay, and these two features, of course, are causing uh, tremendous warming and an accelerated um, uh, ice sheet loss. The, um, the I'm going to stop here. The, the um, accelerated ice sheet um, loss has not been able to be captured in, in current climate models, in part because we haven't understand the dance, if you will, between the atmosphere, the ocean, and the ice itself. Okay? And so over these um, last few years, or the last decade or so, there's been a really concerted effort to try to look at glaciers um, from an atmosphere-ocean ice interaction rather than just from a land-based interaction. And most glaciologists are land-based glaciologists. They study glaciers from the land perspective. But by combining and looking from a, a different, putting new eyes into this and looking at it from an ocean, atmosphere, ice perspective, you, get, you can see processes that merge or dances that emerge here that haven't been modeled before and haven't, certainly haven't been put into climate models per se. And so you wouldn't expect then the climate models to actually um, accurately represent the accelerated sea ice loss. So this, there are sort of two mechanisms that are, are, are going on here. And one is, this is the circulation um, the ocean currents, the w red is warm, the blue is cold water, um, and here you have a Greenland here. And these, these warm currents here, um, under the right conditions, can go up into the fjord systems um, of, the, of the Greenland um, uh, topography, the fjord systems, which of course um, bring f uh, warm water up into these. Now, these things are, these warmer arrows are getting warmer. 
as time goes on here. Um, and what's happening here is that these warm waters, um, they actually um, come in. You have sort of warm surface water, cool, cold waters, and, and often, in a regular sense, in balance, these would be too imbalanced. You would replace enough ice as, as you lose ice. But what's happening is you're getting these warmer fjord waters coming up and eroding, if you will, the, the grounding point of the glacier um, and so cap allows the ice to basically slide off more quickly than it would have in the past. So you've disrupted the dance a little bit. You know that dance is no longer in a balance where you, I, I create enough ice as much as I lose ice. I'm now cre not creating enough ice and I'm losing more ice, basically. So that's one mechanism. The second mechanism that's happening is um, a dance between the atmosphere and the ice. Um, and in, in the winter time, you know, snow basically builds up, and the weight of the snow is, is on, on these glaciers, and they, they slowly sort of migrate down here. But when summer comes, the sunlight comes up, um, it's, the atmosphere is now warmer, and it, and it starts to melt um, and form these lakes. When these lakes get to be large enough, they basically crack the ice, um, and the water just drains along, uh, lubricating, if you will, the bedrock, of the ice, the glacier, with the bedrock here, um, down into the water, and then basically just takes all of this water and dumps it um, into um, the ocean. Okay. Um, eventually, um, what there's this crack here. These 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 lakes, which which form over the, the spring and summer, basically can be quite large in extent. They can take months to form, and once this crack occurs this can discharge that entire lake into the bottom of the glacier um, in about a couple hours. So it, it's very dramatic to see, if you're up there, it's this dramatic cracking and a dramatic um, uh, uh, loss of, of, of the water uh, along the way. So these two combinations of a, of a dance between the land, or the, uh, the, the glacier, the ice, the ocean, and the atmosphere are basically processes now that have been documented, the experiments have been done. Um, you now have to, the ability to, to quantify these, begin to put it into mathematical expressions that could um, eventually be put into, into climate models. Okay. Now, why is this so important? Probably the, one of the most sentinel measurements, the most important measurements that's really needed um, is to understand this glacial process because it will be a major contributor to sea level rise. Okay, and this is a map of the sea level rise from 1993 to 2008. The main reason for showing this is to show you that sea level rise is not uniform across, across the country, uh, across the world. There are places where the sea level rise will be more dramatic, um, other places where it will be less dramatic. Uh, it has been less dramatic. And keep in, in mind, also, there are places where actually the sea level may decline um, because the ice, which has been uh, keeping the sort of land surface down is rebounding, okay, as, as the land or the permafrost in some of the areas in the north begin to um, thaw and melt. But sea level rise is, is probably getting a good idea of the calculation of sea level rise and the implications that it has for coastal cities. A lot of the mega cities in the world, most of the mega cities in the world are lo located in coastal regions. Uh, the implications for infrastructure the implications for migration of peoples, uh, mass migrations and displacements. Um, it, it, current projections would have, for example, the Maldives completely submerged and that um, whole population have to be transported some, to some other um, country along the way. So these are some of the issues there. Now, there, the, this dance, um, is, I've just talked about, is more of a physical dance. Um, but, you know, the dance in the atmosphere, what's happening in the atmosphere and the ocean, um, also plays out in sort of a biogeochemical dance. And um, as the atmospheric carbon dioxide increases, what this map is basically, these plots are showing, here's the carbon dioxide increases um, in the um, surface ocean and in, in the atmosphere, and this is in the, the pH, the resulting pH of the, um, of the ocean. So effectively what's happening is that as the carbon dioxide, the excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that makes it into the ocean, it gets dissolved in the ocean, the carbon dioxide gets dissolved through simple basic chemistry equations that cannot be uh, doubted. Um, you have basically carbonate that um, is basically um, increased and so results in 
basically a pH that declines, okay? This is what we call in terms of ocean acidification. It basically doesn't mean that the, that the ocean is gonna become an acid, but it does mean that the pH of the ocean is decreasing, and there are certain, and it's decreasing rapidly, okay? And this is where the ocean has um, a lot more of a, a responsibility, if you will, than the atmosphere because of the life it harbors. Okay, the biodiversity of life that's in there, the tremendous life that we um, enjoy, the services that we enjoy from that, that biological diversity. And so any um, shell uh, producing organism, coral reef systems are basically uh, worried or are gonna be stressed by um, a lower pH. Uh, certain coral reef systems will be more resilient to this than others, but again, what's happening is that it's happening in such a short time scales that the ability for life systems to actually adapt to changes and evolve to these changes is what's at risk here. Okay. What that means, of course, is, is uh, changes to uh, both at the micro level, this is basically a, a single-celled organism, um, part of the food chain um, that, is, uh, that produces a shell to complete coral reef systems. Um, and there's now demonstrated um, work that's being done in coral reef systems and in shells uh, shell on shell producing um, animals to uh, determine what the consequences might be and to identify which of these species might be a little bit more resistant to these rapid changes and, and if so, or resilient to these rapid changes and if so, how can you nurture them along or protect them um, in ways that um, would perhaps allow them to have a better chance of survival um, in, in some of these environments. So, but what is, what is the, what's, what's the interesting thing about these changes, it's, it's not so much this one thing or that one thing or that one thing, it's what happens when they come together in a real feedback loop system. And so the one thing, one scenario is that it is, and this is just one of these nonlinear feedback systems that oceanographers are, are quite worried about, um, is uh, the triple threat, um, with, uh, which is unexpected consequences, and uh, I'll step through it. You have basically global warming associated with the enhanced carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, I should say, um, at the surface of the ocean. Um, the surface of the ocean is absorbing some of that excess heat, um, and because of, uh, because of that excess heat, you get a warmer layer that reduces the mixing within the ocean interior. Uh, so there's, there's lots of mixing, if you will, of nutrients and everything that go through um, the, the, this sort of surface layer of the ocean. And just think of it as, as, as putting sort of a cap or a lid on some of that. Well, it's not quite a lid, but full there. So what happens there is because that reduces the mixing, then this interior column of the ocean where the mixing would mix oxygen down um, into the deeper levels of, of the ocean um, in, in normal circumstances, um, is not there, okay? So marine mam why is that important? Uh, marine mammals that require oxygen um, from, uh, from the ocean um, are now basically deprived of habitat or areas where they can go because these minimum oxygen zones are basi have basically uh, um, expanded, okay? So what you have here, the surface ocean, the heating reduces the mixing, and these minimum zones basically expand in depth. Now, you com 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 combine that with what's happening on the coast. So, what you have in the coast, another threat to the ocean is the, the tremendous nutrient runoff and atmospheric deposition that feeds phytoplankton pollutants. So, all the pollution, whether it's nitrogen fertilizers, other sorts of other pollutions that, that come off our agricultural lands into our river streams and down into the ocean, um, basically uh, produce nutrient runoff situations. And there's any number of pollutants that, um, uh, um, contribute to this. Um, so they feed these phytoplankton balloons. So you will see these phytoplankton balloons, many of which you can see from space, from the space shot, from the spacecraft. They're quite extensive. Um, the microbes uh, decompose the plankton, um, depleting oxygen in the water. Okay, so you've got two things going on. You've got things going on sort of in the, in a, in a long-term state associated with global warming, and then you have coastal issues going along with, uh, associated with, uh, depleting oxygen in the water in the coastal region associated with pollution activities. Um, you combine this together and what happens is as these expanding oxygen minimum zones sh up here shoal up onto the continental slope 
adding to the low oxygen um, waters here, you even further enhance low oxygen zones. So the ocean is experiencing a lot more low oxygen zones in its coastal regions than in the past. Okay. All right. um, and this just illustrates, again, how this dance between the atmosphere, the ocean, and now life Get, get played out. This is a very, very complicated diet. Well, it's not complicated. It's not that complicated, but it illustrates all of the processes that you have to think about in this dance in terms of nutrient exchange, the shelf rate. This is along the continental shelf. The continental shelf, at least on the east coast, is, is quite a dramatic um, drop off across, across the continental slope. It happens to be the area of some of the most rich biological productivity in the ocean. Um, but understanding um, this atmosphere, ocean interface up here, what's happening in terms of our weather and climate, which forces a lot of these shelf break processes, both at mesoscale and submesoscale, um, uh, and then what happens to um, the ecosystem. This is all of the things that we're trying to figure out when this atmosphere-ocean exchange. So what is the shelf break life lookup? This is, this is basically an autonomous underwater vehicle, um, uh, Remus, that uh, was designed and built and now manufactured by Hydroid. Um, and basically, what this uh, is taking a look uh, at, the, at what's the life on the shelf there um, off of the, the East Coast. And what was I made? This is looking at a camera that's looking. Uh, this is a camera. Start again. There's the Remus um, autonomous underwater vehicle we're being, where it's being um, deployed along the continental shelf here. Um, you have, the, this is the deployment phase um, going into the water. Um, and then you now have a camera that's looking back to the back end of the autonomous underwater vehicle. And all of a sudden you have a complete shoaling or school, schooling of fish uh, following this vehicle. Now why? Why, why is this uh, doing this? It's, it's kind of an interesting sort of look at, at uh, behavior. Um, Close-up look at the shelf is also looking at some of the microbial features that you see here. Um, uh, and you can basically also get an idea of what the, what the food chain is, going, is looking like as well. Okay, so let's get to the next part of this, this presentation. And that is, um, what's the choreography of the dance? Um, in order to do the choreography of the dance, you have to have observations. You have to know what the partners are doing. You have to know what their moves are, okay? You have to be able to have eyes, if you will, to observe um, what these dancers are, um, are doing. Um, in the atmosphere, um, this is a graph of all of the hourly and sub-hourly atmospheric observation stations around the world. Um, this is augmented by satellite data. It's augmented by um, airplane data. Um, it's augmented by um, other data that one can see. So you can see um, that you have a fairly, at least land-based, um, observing system for the atmosphere that is basically your eyes on what the atmosphere is doing, how it's moving along. This is fed, of course, into um, a world data center. Uh, the WMO coordinates these world observations. Um, uh, they are available. They go into your weather forecasting models that you get, um, that you get um, every, every day. You can see that there's uh, certainly some atmospheric um, observations um, over the, uh, uh, from the ground at this time scale um, in ocean, over ocean areas. Those are primarily coming from buoys. So most buoys that go into the ocean have both atmospheric sensors as well as um, oceanographic sensors. Um, but you also see uh, that the, 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 the density is, 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 pretty, is pretty, pretty good um, considering what I'm going to show you next, which is what we have in the ocean. Okay, so the ocean equivalent backbone is the um, Argo program, the Argo sensor. These are Argo floats. They, um, they are easily to um, deploy. You can throw them easily into the ocean. Um, they go down about 2,000 meters um, in terms of a profile that goes up and down um, in the, uh, along a, a wire, and it will measure your standard oceanographic variables of temperature, current, uh, salinity. Um, they're obviously much more sparse than what you saw um, uh, on the atmospheric side. And also keep in mind, though, satellites are not going to penetrate the ocean. Satellites will only give you a measure of the surface, what's happening on the surface. Okay? What's assumed is that the surface expression is an expression of what's happening below. But that not, not, doesn't give you enough details in order to be able to describe the stance. So um, as of September 2014, there were 3,628 of these floats. Um, and this was a, an image of where they are. And they float uh, around the currents. Um, and this is, um, again, 
uh, uh, distributed worldwide. Um, it, it actually goes into weather forecasting um, or into forecast offices um, as well. There's obviously a major um, dearth of observations in the, in the areas where change is happening quite rapidly, up in the Arctic, and of course there's not much in the um, southern ocean regions um, as well. Um, there is, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about how, how, how we're now changing some of these observing eyes, if you will, on, on these dancers. Um, and the Argo float system um, currently measures depth, temperature, and salinity. It uh, goes down to about 2,000, 2000 meters, as you say. Here's the wire. Um, it takes about, it has about one hour at surface. It records the temperature and salinity as it rises, and it drifts uh, basically for about 10 days before it comes back up and goes back down again. There are, um, in the plans, deep Argo floats that will measure down to 6,000 meters of depth. Um, this is really, really important given the fact that for the first time we're beginning to see that um, heating going down and deep into the ocean. We really want to get deeper down into the ocean. So um, these deep Argo floats, um, if funding should uh, arise, are, are basically available um, and, and are, are ready to be able to go. Um, and many of the uh, Argo systems um, are being, some of them are being replaced with um, these deep Argo floats. What's more interesting in many ways is the new innovation or new develop technology development of incorporating biological sensors and not just physical sensors um, on these Argo floats uh, that they'll measure variables such as dissolved oxygen, dissolved organic matter, nitrate, chlorophyll, particle scattering. Um, um, and these are just in the testing stage right now and something that would really begin to um, enhance our understanding of the dance between what's happening in the ocean and its um, biological response. Um, the other thing is what to do in the Arctic, and indeed under ice. And so there's been, uh, again, development of uh, uh, an ice-tethered profiler um, that uh, we'll be able to take, that, is that takes measurements, again, along a wire here. Basically, it's a buoy, this is a yellow buoy here that's, uh, that's embedded in the ice um, with you have a profiler that goes up and down. Like I said, oh, and here's, no, sorry. I should. Uh, okay. Um, here is the, uh, uh, basically the system here. Um, it, gets, uh, it goes uh, basically up and down. And then this, this whole uh, ice tether profiler just flows with, uh, as the ice moves. So, you know, with GPS coordinates, you can track basically where it's moving, so you have an idea where the sensor is going. It communicates its data back up through um, a satellite. Um, and here's just an example of, of the motion of these um, ice tether profilers um, around over the, in the Arctic region um, over a given time period. They're disposable. Um, they're, you don't pick them up. You lose them. Um, and they're, they're relatively inexpensive when you when you talk about in terms of um, oceanographic um, instrumentation. So this has given some sort of opportunity to take a look at getting some physical measurements underneath um, the ice uh, to determine what's happening up in these regions. There are a lot of other frontiers of knowledge um, in the ocean where the technology is, is basically ready um, and has been underdeveloped. A lot of it is ready to be um, deployed certainly working under ice with uh, autonomous under vehicles, not just to get the vertical dimension, but to be able to move horizontally underneath the ice, the climate dimension, the deep zones, um, of, of the, basically the, the trenches, if you will, which house a, a diversity of life that we know that we are just beginning to explore. Um, the midwater columns where there's an inverted pyramid of biomass um, and the marine microbial area, which is um, also um, pretty critical. And this last area, these biology areas, are where there's been tremendous advances in um, thinking and, and developing technologies. But let me first just uh, talk about um, exploring under the ice using a vehicle that allows you to get horizontal movement and be able to take measurements or take looks horizontally. And this is uh, the Nereid under ice uh, vehicle that was just um, developed at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. This is video from its first test drive that was just happened this, um, uh, last year. Um, and what you're seeing here is uh, views of uh, the water column, not just vertically, but uh, horizontally. And because there are cameras both looking downward as well as upward, you could see this microbial life just hanging on the underside um, of the ice. 
the biologist that was on this particular cruise, this expedition basically said they had no idea that there was that much microbial life living underneath the, uh, underneath the ice in the Arctic region. So um, now this is visualization. This is just taking a look at visualizing. Um, and, and a lot of oceanography takes advantage of, of, of imaging. But um, there are other ways that one has made progress in looking at the, at the biology of what's going on. And um, if you look at the bottom of the food chain, plankton, and plankton is a catch-all term for microbes and bacteria and single-celled organisms and simple organisms. Plankton, they're the bottom of the food chain. And, and this is the many faces of plankton. This is, you know, images of, of, of various plankton. Um, and, you know, what you'd like to know is that, as a biologist is which species are present, what are they doing, how is the ecosystem changing o over time. Um, and uh, uh, using a, a new technique, or a new um, uh, instrument that's built by um, scientist Heidi Sosik, called an imaging flow cytobot, which is really uh, an automated underwater microscope. And it uses um, a system that combines uh, video and, uh, and flow um, cytometric technology to capture both images of plankton um, in the water column for identification and also measures then the, the chlorophyll uh, fluorescence associated uh, with that image. The images are then uh, automatically classified in the system. Um, the chlorophyll is basically used to help identify the characteristics, um, and it has a huge database, as you can imagine. Uh, in, 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 uh, in oceanography, the, the issue of big data is, uh, is prominent, particularly in um, looking at uh, imagery such as this. Um, but the, the large volume of imagery has required uh, us to look at a solution for, uh, uh, that allows automatic analysis and, and identification. Um, and uh, the installation on Martha's Vineyard, uh, which is where she, uh, Heidi's done a lot of her initial work here, she's now collected over 500 million images. Um, the last story I'd like to tell is by working with uh, this scientist, this domain scientist working with an information computational scientist We've been able to find a solution to this, her imagery problem. Um, and I know that it was a success when she told me that, uh, when I asked her, what does this project meant to you? She said, I can do in six hours what would have taken me six years to do. So that's the, that's the power of what you can do for this sort of thing. Um, this is an environmental sample processor. This is another new biological sensor. Um, it's basically a genetics can in a lab, a genetics lab in a can. You submerge it in the ocean. You basically are using it for looking at genomic markers of species in, in, in the water, and particularly for looking at them in terms of harmful algal bloom identification and toxicity that might occur. So you take the water, it gets filtered, you do the lysec, you do the chemistry in order to, to, do, to release the DNA and RNA. Um, you uh, you add, add a sample to um, and process the, the probe, and then eventually the probe will get compared with a, uh, a standardized puck that has the known genetic structures of the toxins that you're, that you're trying to determine. So this is, is now getting uh, used. This is the image array that, that one comes back that identifies and then ships back to shore um, if there's a particular um, toxin um, in place. So this is also revolutionizing then um, our ability to really do some major genomic studies. And in fact, this combined with um, biological modeling of harmful algal blooms, um, uh, which I think I'm gonna have to just show here. This is the model of, a, of, of taking some, some looking at uh, the, the biological life cycle of a particular cyst, um, how it interfaces with its atmosphere and ocean environment, and how the bloom basically matures, writing the mathematical model for it, creating then um, a model that could capture what, a, a, what this bloom particularly would look like. And this work is now being used um, in an experimental operational mode with NOAA to identify harmful algal bloom outbreaks um, along the Northeast um, as well. Um, so basically, uh, uh, what, what we have in the ocean is a situation where you have a lot of scales of motion that operating a lot of temporal scales. And you've got tools or platforms that, that need to basically put those eyes to, to observe the dance, what's, what's happening here. 
Um, so observatories and moorings uh, might be, cover this, these sort of spatial and time scales, drifters and floats, satellite observations, long-range autonomous underwater vehicles, and, and sort of shorter-range autonomous underwater vehicles. And I thought I'd share with you just a little bit um, about what our thinking is um, in the institution about um, uh, using uh, the advances in sort of robotics um, uh, and, and in making uh, autonomous underwater vehicles um, actually uh, do more than what they have in the past. So um, this is sort of a, a diagram of, of some of our thinking, um, uh, of sort of a phased approach uh, to um, uh, autonomous exploration of, of the ocean and, and what you have here um, is uh, basically an AUV um, uh, that could be working at um, tens of kilometers spacing here. Um, you have a ship that's sort of launched this autonomous underwater vehicle, as well as an autonomous surface uh, vehicle. And that autonomous surface vehicle is providing, in a sense, the communication um, and for this particular AUV that's doing some work down in the ocean here, doing some sampling and uh, measurements. Um, and it might be doing this for one or two days. Um, the ship can go off for one or two days, do something um, other than work that it's doing, and come back. The, the AUSV, Autonomous Surface Vehicle, can communicate with the ship and get back. So that's sort of phase one in terms of AUV operations, or autonomous exploration. Uh, phase two would, uh, would just shown here, sort of a, a ridge survey that might be hundreds of kilometers in spatial um, dimension. And, and in this case, you have uh, an autonomous surface um, vehicle that is basically replacing the ship altogether, okay? Um, and it, it, you're doing the communication. Uh, it's, it's launched the, the, the AUV. Um, it's doing all the communication, and it communicates back to shore um, the data that it gets. Phase three, which is totally on a paper design blue sky phase, um, would be where you have basin scale surveys and looking at thousands of kilometers of, of, of surveys. And, and in here, you basically have pure um, autonomy here. The, um, the, there's a change, if you will, in the um, surface vessel itself. The autonomous surface vessel has become uh, a lot more powerful. It can communicate um, more easily through uh, perhaps some, an optical modem, which has, has been developed along the way um, in this work. So um, typically, when you are looking at autonomy in the ocean, people think about as decision making is a, sort of a key intellectual thing. How do the humans and machines interface? What will the robot do? What, could, what will you want it to do? Um, but the ability for a, a human to, to basically communicate objectives in a simple way in the ocean um, is essential for these functional systems. And they, are, they require some very highly flexible um, software systems that are out there now that will carry out very complex um, missions. Um, but they're still just pretty difficult to configure. Um, and indeed, a lot of operator error is uh, pretty uh, rampant in, uh, it's a significant, significant issue in um, autonomous underwater vehicle operations. So the, this basically this, this sort of issue of having sensors and perception, how does the robot sense and understand the ember the deceit, the, 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 the key it, that's got to be new and, and, and worked on is a decision-making software that allows the robot to make a decision, okay, uh, and make that decision in real time and progressive levels of, of sophistication that will occur in that decision-making um, ability. So... One of, the way, one, of, one of the biggest problems in doing autonomous work um, and surveying in the ocean is communication. Most, uh, I mean, the only way you can really, in the past, li li communicate with vehicles over large distances through acoustics, and acoustics bandwidth is obviously very, very, very low. Uh, we've just developed an optical modem. What you're seeing here is video in real time that was transmitted through an optical modem. So we've gotten to the point with an optical modem um, in the ocean with, a, with the right sort of range that you can basically couple with acoustic communication in order to get some very high bandwidth that can basically solve your data problem and your communication problem um, that allows sort, sort of more rapid decision making um, to occur. Um, this allows the opportunity to think about instilling a robot with curiosity. Right now, um, our robots in the ocean are programmed. They're programmed to mow the lawn. You, send, you throw an AUV. If you're doing a, a new survey, and you'll just mow the lawn, okay? This is basically how we found Air France 447, the, the airplane that crashed. You just mow the lawn, you mow the lawn, you mow the lawn, and oh, oh, it looks like there's something that's over there. 
Okay, now then go down and put cameras down and you, and you can find things. So, um, but the real question is, in, in real human exploration of anything, you are looking and you're looking and you're looking and all of a sudden you say, ah, I see something interesting there. I want to go over there. This stuff isn't look that interesting. You want eventually the robot to have enough environmental awareness and decision making capabilities that it could make that decision to uh, get away from its mowing and go on and explore um, something that might be um, interesting. Which leads, to, in general, to the next generation of, of co-robotic systems. And now we're talking about systems. Systems that put all these platforms together, all these sensors together in ways that um, can run autonomously and give you continuous data. And this is just a sort of a, a schematic that illustrates the, the numbers of platforms that are tethered. Some are tethered, some are autonomous. Um, some have sensors, these are, are profilers here. Um, and these are gliders with docking stations. So you, you see all sorts of um, opportunities here to begin to put these uh, robotic systems together um, and collect uh, images, collect sens sensor data, uh, and, and combine human intelligence in ways that, um, that we haven't done before. One of the most uh, interesting projects that have been working on over the last seven years has been the Obs Ocean Observatories Initiative which um, is a $300 million initiative sponsored by the National Science Foundation to put one of these observing systems in place in uh, six locations, um, two um, in the Northern Sea, one at Papa, one at Erminger, one at Argentine Basin, the Southern Ocean, and then two coastal rays, one off the uh, New England coast and one off the Juan de Fuca Plate, using, again, these profilers, gliders, um, autonomous underwater vehicles, this is being deployed right now. Data is now coming back. It will, for the first time, give oceanographers 24 hours a day information, seven days a week, 360 days a year, something the atmospheric scientists have long had. Um, and that should really change the way you do it. The other thing that's happening um, is this real interest in the Arctic and its influence on the North Atlantic. If you look at the Gulf Stream in the North Atlantic, uh, you see um, up in the Arctic regions a very, very complex circulation uh, this has not been measured, okay? It has not been measured. There's been a tropical or uh, a subtropical array across the um, Atlantic Basin down here. So for the first time, this program here, again funded by um, NSF, NSF's taking the lead, uh, and international collaborators is beginning to take a good tr north uh, transatlantic look um, across this very important circulation feature. With the freshening of the uh, Arctic um, water into the North Atlantic, there are some expectations that what would, might happen with the, with the Gulf Stream circulation and, of course, which would play out with the atmosphere in terms of changes in weather along the way. And finally, on an ecosystem scale, um, observatories that are uh, being made on a much smaller scale to look at nutrient fluxes, ecosystem fluxes um, in areas that um, have a lot of biological productivity to get to the point where you're not just looking at a single species, but you're looking at a whole ecosystem and the ability to model, to model that. Why? Why? Who cares? Okay. And, and in reality, there are many countries right now looking at the ocean as their new economy. Um, the, the Europeans are looking at this. The Asians are looking at this. The United States doesn't so much use the term blue economy, but you, you know that there's elements along with this. And, and all of this science, all of this information um, leads to an economy that certainly has a, a technology component. Um, it has a biotech and bioprospecting component. We just had a, a scientist um, look at an algae, and they're able to produce two fuels uh, from that. Um, uh, uh, fisheries and aquaculture information, ocean energy and resources, uh, uh, another area. Informatics, any business that is climate or weather sensitive should be interested in ocean information. Um, and, of course, the ability to manage and assess uh, the health of marine protected um, areas. Um, the hazards, I'll end with the hazards of working in the ocean. This is a, a Remus vehicle. That we had this um, going out in the, in the ocean one day, collecting, uh, uh, doing some shark tagging. Actually, we wanted to look at sharks. Um, and, and how they worked in their habitat. And uh, there are some hazards along the way um, that one works in the ocean that one often doesn't have on land, um, or at least uh, that can't see. So uh, with that, I'll end, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs> I'll say 
say for those of you who are mainline uh, scientists in the audience, you're feeling a lot better about your users right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. So what is the one thing you don't know right now that you both would want to know? Oh, the one thing we know, oh boy, that's a hard question. There's so many things that um, we would want to know. I, I, think, I, think, I think we would want to know how the, the basic circulation system is changing. Okay? All right? I think that's one of the things that we really would like to know. This last year, uh, in, Nove in, in November, or in 2014, all the conditions were ripe for an El Nino to happen. We talked about it in the newspaper. There were lots of talks about an El Nino year is coming, El Nino is going to be here. It did not materialize. Why? Okay, and there's some, there's about five hypotheses out there right now of an atmosphere ocean exchange property. Why? So some of these normal patterns that we've expected before are not happening anymore. Why? So. Those are some of the reasons. I would say the other thing is the life system, okay. the, the life system that we have in the ocean. That is probably one of the most precious things that we have on this planet. Yes. Questions? Yes, Paul. Uh, second hydrate. Yes. What do we know what the well, are they going to bite us? <laughs> Uh, some people are mining them. <laughs> uh, Japan has done some mining of, of the deep sea um, uh, methane hydrates for um, energy. Um, methane, methane is a, a certainly a, a big greenhouse gas. A lot of the methane hydrates are basically um, uh, under pressure. They're in the deep ocean. They're under pressure, cold temperatures. Um, and, you know, the pressure is not going to change. Okay? But methane hydrates associated with permafrost, uh, the release of methane associated with permafrost melting is something we should be concerned about. You know, I, I've talked to my geologists about this, and they're kind of skeptical. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they would say on a cautionary note right now, from a scientist's point of view, they would be worried about what's happening in the permafrost area. But all of that methane that is basically in the calthrates um, associated in the deep sediments um, of the ocean, they're there, be, they're embedded in that because of two things. You have to have the cold temperatures, and you have to have the pressure. Okay? Now, if it were to be released, it may most likely would not, according to them, most likely would not get to the atmosphere. It would just get dissolved within the ocean itself. So it might have, it might have consequences, dramatic consequences in the ocean. Um, I don't know what would happen, but um, it, it, it wouldn't necessarily make it up um, into the atmosphere. It would just go into a gaseous form and, and get dissolved in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah, they were selected uh, primarily by science drivers. Um, and there was a scientific workshop that was held on, on what you could do um, with sort of more continuous observation and sort of what were some of the key outstanding questions. So um, on the, and the, the Pioneer Ray, the coastal array um, off of uh, New England there, that's basically just south of George's Bank. George's Bank, again, is high bi biological act uh, activity, and it's also um, it's, a, it's a nested grid. It's, a, it's got a high resolution and a little larger horizontal resolution than a, uh, and then a larger, uh, and then so it's sort of a nested grid of, of observations that cover the shelf and the shelf break. Um, and that is, a, from, a, from a biological and physical point of view, it's, it's such a dynamic region um, in, in the ocean that we know nothing about. Um, and so that's why that reason was chosen. The one, the coastal array on the left, on the, on the west coast is on the Juan de Fuca Plate. It's one of the most instrumented um, and obviously uh, earthquake prone zones. It's a Cascadia uh, fault um, and um, lots of information that's, that's kind of needed. It's been a, a, an easy place to really get to um, a plate tectonic area to study the geology that's happened. The um, two northern papa. Um, has been um, a long-term observing site in the, in the Pacific that just needed, um, that, that has anchored some climate models but needed more continuous operation and data. The Erminger Sea was very interesting because if you look at climate models, um, any climate model that you look at if they, that makes projections of sea surface, or sea, uh, yes, surface temperature uh, up to 2050, you'll see that it's mostly red. Okay, the temperatures increase, 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 except over the Erminger Sea. The Erminger Sea is that area where there's deep return circulation 
um, of cold wa through cold water um, deep down into the ocean. And, and that's where that OSNAP program is, was really important. The two southern ones, um, actually the Argentine was just added at the last minute. The southern ocean is, in, in part, the southern ocean is believed to be one of the largest areas of uptake of carbon dioxide, that, as well as the Atlantic. Um, and we have very few observations in the southern ocean, absolutely. Very little, so that was to sort of to anchor um, uh, what what might be an international uh, observing array um, in the Southern Ocean. The Argentine Basin, in a sense, is also a very um, critical um, point, and from a climate perspective and a biological perspective as well, sort of a, a counterpoint to the the Pioneer Array in terms of the the biology um, and and the physics that is, is down there. So a workshop was held. These big scientific questions were said. What could we do if we had continuous operations? This array, these arrays, of the OOI are supposed to last for 25 years. So we're talking about a long-term observing, a major um, uh, sort of um, uh, investment, if you will, in ocean observing for some key areas. Yeah. So that's how it was decided. All right. Any last questions? Yeah. Thank you. So in one of in one of your videos, uh, there was a school of fish following the autonomic um, yeah. vehicle. Yeah. Um, why did that happen? And if we see this, something changes by, by the measurements, can you draw any conclusions about how your observations are actually affecting yeah. the ocean? Yeah, so, so the, the answer is they were actually very surprised by the schooling of fish um, behind the vehicle. The vehicle was, was put in, again, this is uh, one of these, this is again off that continental sh um, shelf. Um, lots of biological activity in general, but you wouldn't see it like this. But for some reason, they really loved that autonomous underwater vehicle. And they just came to it. So why? You know, those are the things we just don't know. Yeah, just don't know. Don't know. So they will be working on that. They'll be answering, trying to. It could be their currents. It could be, currents, it, could be their, it could be some heat that was being let off. It could be, you know, it could be. Curiosity, for all I know. <laughs> but I think it, it probably is some motion in the ocean that emulated something that the fish thought might be interesting food-wise, probably. Jonathan. In the uh, area, especially of autonomous vehicles, I wonder uh, to the extent to which you're <clears throat> either collaborating or competing with, like, the U.S. Navy. <laughs> Well, first of all, um, uh, one has to appreciate in oceanography that the Navy has been probably the, the single most uh, great investment in um, uh, oceanography um, sis uh, observing systems. Um, and certainly AUVs and the history of AUVs, the development of AUVs have been really supported by the Navy um, all along. The NSF is taking advantage of it right now. But the Navy investment in ocean OBS has been huge since, since World War II. Um, and, uh, they, they have, we, we, work, we work with the Navy. Um, we obviously get funding from the Navy. Um, uh, and they see um, a lot of the potential. Obviously, they get nervous when we get, you know, get too excited about working with places like China and other places. But um, uh, for the most part, I think they've been very supportive of, of a, a lot of this work. We, uh, we collaborate with them. They almost think that we almost think of it as a partnership that we have with the Navy. Uh, we used to be block funded by the Navy. I wish that was still the case. In World War II, they, the Navy really block funded both Woods Hole Oceanographic as well as Scripps. Those were the, some of the glory days of funding. Uh, now it's, it's like mini NSF in a way. But there have been long-term programs of technology development um, funded by the Navy, and they've been, been a, great, a great supporter. We have formed a new Center for Marine Robotics. That's um, our new um, effort to really look at some of these uh, co-robotic um, challenges. And we're partnering with academic institutions um, that have had a robotics experience, not in the marine environment, but in things like manufacturing, um, biomedical applications, uh, things like that, so that we can learn from them. Um, and we've been working closely with the aerospace department at MIT in environmental awareness, and the ability to sense and uh, they're working on the autonomous car. What can we learn from that environmental um, awareness, the sensing, the, and the real-time decision-making that has to be made? So I think the next generation of co-robotics, we, we really see the robotics field um, uh, blossoming in many ways with so many applications. Um, it's fairly easy to make a robot go in a swimming pool. It's not as easy to make it really work in the ocean. Um, uh, so that's, that's part of that. And that real-time decision-making, to make that curious robot 
um, and that robot that will sense environmental awareness and be able to make its decisions on its own instead of just programming it to do so. That, that's, that's sort of the vision and the dream. So one last question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There are people who do atmospheric modeling on a grand scale. I assume you probably know quite a lot about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, the inputs come from the ocean and various other things. The calculations are such that a person who isn't doing those calculations really can't see through them very well. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, Given the state of information that you know about the oceans especially, but also the atmosphere, mm -hmm. should we now be believing that those predictions are really very accurate? Well, I think I understand your question. It's true that, you know, modeling of the atmosphere, um, if you're really going to do a model right of the atmosphere, particularly of a climate model of the atmosphere, the climate is more than the atmosphere. It, it has to have the ocean in there. And um, there's been more and more sophisticated um, ocean modeling, okay, that has uh, developed over the years by many, many groups um, that have incorporated some of these new processes that we're seeing and obviously more vertical and horizontal resolution. Um, those then get incorporated at places like the National Center for Atmospheric Research or Los Alamos or, you know, probably here for that matter, uh, Oak Ridge, that, um, that, that basically inc incorporate uh, more and more sophisticated um, ocean models. I always, you know, uh, do I believe the models? I certainly believe them enough to, to, to know that climate change is happening um, and uh, that, that we have some, but we, we, the models will have to improve, uh, particularly if you're gonna take it down to a regional scale um, and, and looking at regional climate projections, so. As you know, the American the Council of the American Physical Society has endorsed those yeah. and uh, drawn very strong conclusions. Yeah. Yeah. And my question is really, well, do you personally think those conclusions can be justified yes. at the present time? Yeah, I, I believe strongly in the IPCC and the conclusions that have been derived from the IPCC. I think they're significant. I think that that you can argue with um, uncertainty um, levels and some of the things, but the basic fundamental uh, premise that we have um, a, a changing climate that's basically human-induced um, is, is, is validated by the evidence. And it's not just the model itself, it's the data as well. And, and you know, people, I, I can have, I, I have been on many panels with um, skeptics, um, and what, what happens is that they tend to um, cherry-pick a part of a, of a temperature record um, and they, they will take, and they'll, they'll only look at um, an atmospheric signal. And I think when you start looking at the climate problem, you have to think about it not just as a global temperature um, increase or a global temperature measurement. You have to think about it in terms of the things that you're seeing regionally, the things that you're seeing in terms of storms and the probability of, of extreme weather. Um, you have to look at it in terms of the ocean acidification. I can talk about climate more climate change more easily with a, a public person when I talk to them about what's happening to coral reef systems um, because they can see that, okay? Um, it, it's, it's putting, if you will, a, a climate system that is it's an atmosphere, ocean, land um, scenario and you lighting all the evidence up in migration patterns, fishery habitat changes uh, that cannot be explained in terms of probability arguments um, any other way. People will argue it's the sun. I, I said you can put the sun, the solar forcing um, in these models um, and you can take the solar forcing out. Uh, the sun is certainly important to put in these climate models and the variations of the solar output, but it, it does not explain the rapid changes that we're seeing over um, a short period of time. So I believe it, yeah. I would take action. So I think we could, <laughs> we could go on for a long time after That's this, but just uh, out of consideration <laughs> for our speaker, you. let's thank her again, and uh, really fascinating stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you.